Hi there, and welcome to On That If I Want To. I'm Andrew Mowry of Dre Renee Knits. Apparently, I have run how to cross my legs. All right. Hi, welcome. Today, I am wearing my Gib pullover, which just feels right. I am enjoying this wintry weather and being dressed in all the wool. I am back in wool pants as well. Again, today, it's a different pair of wool pants, but I got to say, wool all the way. All right. So, I guess that's all I got to say. This is what I'm wearing. Let's answer some questions. Question number one. I recently explained to a non-knitter friend about gauge swatches and blocking, and she totally stumped me with her question. She asked, since a yarn can grow when it's blocked, and gauge swatches can be imperfect when estimating how much a yarn can change when blocked, why don't we soak yarn before knitting with it? Wouldn't that give a better understanding of the final state of the yarn while knitting versus waiting until the end? So the yarn's already been soaked. That yarn, when it was made, had to be finished. And so whoever made the yarn washed it and soaked it before it got to you. Now, if a yarn has been hanging out for a really long time and twisted up in a tight skein or have what have you, uh, then it might be a little tense and it would relax with a soaking, but I don't think it would be necessary. I think that would just create a massive extra step in our knitting to try and wash our yarn and then swatch with it. And then you would still need to block the swatch because you're also, once we've knit it, it depends on how we're knitting it. If we're using a stitch pattern, so many different stitch patterns are going to change quite a bit with blocking. So cables, lace, etc. And so you would still have to wash that swatch to know what the finished gauge is going to be of that swatch or stitch pattern. So yes, to answer your friend's question, I think the easiest way I could say it is that yarn's already been washed and soaked and blocked, if you will, because that's how we finish yarn after it's been spun or dyed. And um, so we don't really need to do that again ourselves. The reason we block our swatch after the fact is because we are going to block our finished knit. So whenever we're done knitting something, we are going to wash it, AKA block it and lay it out to dry. And so by doing the same thing with our swatch, that is how we can try to have a more accurate idea of where we're gonna end up. And yes, there are nuances. The fact that for instance, in a sweater, there's a lot more weight happening in a whole sweater that's going to kind of pull on that fabric and maybe change that gauge a little bit than a little tiny swatch, which is why you'll often hear like the bigger swatch you can do, the more accurate the results you're going to get and why it's important to swatch in the same way we are going to knit and finish that object. So for instance, if we're knitting a sweater in the round, our swatch needs to be in the round because our gauge will change between being in the round and being knit flat. Um, so I hope that answered that question. That's a good one though. All right, some of my favorite patterns of yours are your moon series, moon whistle, moon wake, and I see a spring moon too. I wondered if you had a moon affinity or if this naming cadence was just a coincidence. So I do love the moon and I actually, y'all used to be able to see it in the back, but now it's up here. I have this little brass moon phase garland that hangs up above here. Um, but that series started with, I did not name Spring Moon. That was actually named by Amarisu, which is where that pattern was first published. But Moon Wake became before Moon Whistle. And naming patterns is honestly, for me, one of the hardest parts. Like, once in a blue moon, I will have the name right when I'm starting the pattern. There will be something funny or just that works really well that I will just write from the get-go. That's what I'm calling it in my little design journal. But more often than not, I do not have a name until a week or two before I publish because I'm like, I just don't know. So I do a lot of online thesaurus and synonyms. And I don't know how I found Moonwake. 
but I loved it because the definition of it is basically how we will see like if you imagine the sun rising over the water and you see the sun's reflection across the water moon wake is that same idea but with the moon and i just loved that so i'm glad you like that series as well and moon whistle definitely came after i had named moon wake i i think in one of my kids books I don't think it was actually Moon Whistle. Maybe there was just Moon and Whistle on the same page. I can't remember, but I was like, I loved the name Moon Wake so much. So um, Moon Whistle came about after reading with my kids and thinking about how I think all the time, I've actually helped my husband named a few. He, my husband's a musician and he'll have to name his songs. So he goes through this as well. Like, what do I name this? And I'm always like, don't ask me. I can barely name my patterns. <laughs> But I did help him name some of his songs. He actually has a number of songs with the word moon in it as well because I think that Moon Week one, I was like, I love it. So I was like, what else could I put with moon? So anyways, that was a, a fun one to answer. All right, next question. I don't know about y'all, but in the winter, it's like I cannot get enough water. Okay, I've been wanting to learn to spin for a while and watching your Friday episodes inspired me to go for it. I finally took a private spinning lesson over the holidays and I'm going to rent a wheel to practice before committing to purchasing a wheel. I know it's different for everyone, but curious to know how long did it take you to get a level of consistency in your spinning so that you spun a yarn that you could actually use? So there's a follow-up question here, but I'm going to answer this one first. Um, I... I mean, it took me a minute. So I'm trying to think of how to answer that. I, I'm like trying to go back in my mind. My first skein was atrocious. I have shown it on here in a past episode. I had just strangled the life out of that fiber. It was so overspun and overplied. It was like my type A personality really came out. And I was just like, <laughs> it's actually, you know, most people's first skein is really thick and thin. And usually on the bulkier side, mine was like, <laughs> lace <laughs> um so I did not I have not knit anything with that very first skein I just keep it it's my little my little pretty first skein but after that I did have I bought a little bit of fiber I know I bought a braid from my neighborhood fiber co and I spun that and I still have that skein although it's really loose I kind of went from one extreme to the other so then I really underplied and then I had some practice fiber from my friends that they had given me and so I practiced with that and that helped me start to feel a little more confident so I would say the first three skeins of yarn I made I did not knit with um a lot of I think it's great to knit with those first skeins even if they are thick and thin and not consistent whatsoever because you can still weave with them or make a hat or something fun like that um I just kept them because I was already on my way to now spinning the next spin because I was having so much fun with just the spinning process but pretty much after those I jumped in and did a sweater spin and I knit a sweater so I just showed that a couple weeks ago I think it was just two weeks ago maybe three that I wore my hand spun nurtured sweater and that was out of some local main fiber that I got from Port Fiber here in Portland and I just went for it. It was a two ply. It's definitely inconsistent and thick and thin but that's why I think nurtured is a great pattern to use for hand spun because the texture works great with thick and thin and yeah I think you just kind of got to jump into it. And I will say, I kind of touched on this actually just in the last episode, that I think it's really important to knit with your hand spun because you don't truly know what is going on in that yarn until you get it on your needles or your hook or your loom, however you're choosing to use your hand spun. But it's amazing how much I learn each time I actually knit with my hand spun, which I love knitting with my hand spun. I think that once you've knit with hand spun, it's hard to go back sometimes to machine milled yarn because there is this life force that is enhanced spun yarn that I think is just magical. So, I mean, don't get me wrong. I still love all of my beautiful yarns in my collection and 
will absolutely use them all the time, but I do often think, but how could I add a little bit of my hand spun to this? Because it just has this energy in it. It's so much fun. And every time I knit with it, I definitely learn like, oh, okay, maybe next time for the sock yarn, I want to add even more twists than I did because I think I can make it stronger. Or um, maybe I want to try playing with color in this way with these painted tops because I didn't like what happened here or I really like what happened here. So definitely start knitting with that hand spun, even if it's not consistent, because what you might also be surprised by as well is how much, blah, 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 how much more even it actually can end up looking in your knit fabric than you think it will. Like sometimes I'll look at a skein and be like, ooh, it's a little inconsistent. And then I knit with it and it just doesn't even matter, especially if you knit anything with a little bit of texture. So like Gib has this all over, this is one of my favorite stitch patterns. I've used it in a lot of my patterns. Um, but I think this would do beautiful with hand spun, um, nurtured, even just garter stitch works so well with hand spun because it's gonna help hide any inconsistencies. Okay. Oh, and the second part of that question was, and at what point did you start to learn different ways of spinning and plying? So it's such a great question. I took a, a minute to feel comfortable moving on from just my short forward basic two to three ply yarns that I was trying to make. And a lot of times those are still my default yarn. I started learning more ways of drafting I would say one to two years in, might have even been two years. I didn't try chain plying until I got my electric wheel, my Hanson mini spinner. And I did love learning chain plying on that because I wasn't thinking about my feet. It's a lot to do with your hands. It's just different. Once you do it, it's actually like, oh, okay, this isn't as hard as I thought it would be. When I saw my teacher do it when I first learned how to spin, I was like, yeah, I'm never doing that. <laughs> it just looked so hard to me uh but then i tried it and especially on my e-spinner i was like okay this isn't so bad and really fun um and then woolen spinning i took a class last year and then i took a class again this year and woolen has been definitely more challenging for me to feel comfortable with it but i feel like it finally just clicked so it's definitely a slower process for me i still put myself in the beginner camp when it comes to spinning i I don't know that I'll ever be on the level. Like I have friends who started teaching classes on spinning like two years after they started. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I, your brain must work differently than mine because I could not teach a class on this. I still feel so new myself and I've been spinning now for three or four years. <laughs> um, so it's definitely a journey and I think just trying to enjoy it along the way and knowing that even your inconsistent yarns will be beautiful to knit with. Um, might even kind of surprise you a little bit. But I think just once you feel comfortable, and I would say too, what I learned a little bit later in the game was feeling comfortable adjusting your wheel is what can really help then give you the confidence to learn different drafting or plying styles. Because once I could adjust my wheel, it opened everything up and I started to feel much more confident as a spinner because I didn't feel like the fiber was going to be like torn out of my hand and I just felt more in control of the situation. So there you go. All right, next question. I'm a recent designer and just wondering if there is a thing as republishing a pattern in a different yarn. My two patterns I have released, the yarn is now 100% discontinued. I would love to redo them in readily available yarn, but I don't know if that's a thing. Sure, absolutely. I have a couple patterns that the yarn no longer is out there. It is one of the hard things, but that's, you know, any, any industry is going to have businesses that close down for whatever reason. So, um, I think that your customers would probably greatly appreciate that. I've definitely had friends who've done that. Um, I think I have gone back and at least added other yarns I thought would work because you don't necessarily always have time to maybe do a whole new sample. Um, but I think if you do, and especially, I think it's a great way to breathe new life into a pattern you've already published as well and an opportunity to see it um, in a new color and a new yarn, I think can be so much fun. So absolutely, if the yarn you released it in no longer exists, 
there's no reason not to do that. And I know that customers love to be able to see it knit up in whatever yarn you're suggesting. So I say go for it. All right, next question. I am joining in on the Weekender Spin It to Knit It Challenge, and I am so grateful that you threw this challenge out there. I have started spinning again after a 10-year hiatus, and I am just having the time of my life. This just made me so happy. I am so glad I challenged myself to become a better spinner, so thanks for the little kick to get it going again. Yay! Would you mind sharing a bit about your spinning story? How you got started? What was the catalyst that drew you to make your own yarn? What projects you made with those first overspun skeins of yarn? Or maybe you were a pro right out the gates. Definitely not. <laughs> um, also, what helped you to take your spinning to the next level? Was it a class, YouTube video, or did you just spin a lot? You've mentioned several books, so I've been reading and learning a lot, but I'm curious what helped you get from a beginner level. So, I... I actually first learned to spin when I lived in New Zealand and that was such a cool experience and I think it planted the seed for me to want to come back to it later. Um, when I moved home from New Zealand, sadly my wheel did not come with me along with most of my belongings. I was not actually planning to move back when I did. So I often wonder like, where is that wheel? It was a really special wheel. The person who made it um, he used driftwood that he found on the beach and made it for his wife and everyone who'd ever owned it signed to the bottom. So it was a really neat wheel. But basically when we moved to Maine, I saw that my friend Casey who owns Port Fiber was teaching a spinning class. And for years I told myself, nope, I do not have time for another craft, another hobby. I also didn't feel like I could use my hands when you're in my designs because I didn't want to frustrate anyone and have them be like, well, I can't get that yarn. Um, so I just wasn't sure how that would be received. So I was like, okay, I'm going to, my fear and what kept me from learning for a little while was I don't want to just make yarn and never use it because I would feel sad for the yarn. Now, I have some different thoughts on that. I think if you just love to spin, you can absolutely spin, and there are plenty of people who will take that hand spun off your hands if you don't want to knit or make with it yourself. But that was just one of the things I was trying to figure out was, is this something that I can invest time and money in? Could it really fit into my life? And so when I saw Casey was teaching a class, I was like, okay, I just want to go try it again because it sounds fun. And I mean, by the end of the first class, I was like, oh, I'm totally gonna end up getting a wheel. <laughs> like it just right away, I was like, this is so much fun. So that was kind of the beginning of my journey. And I feel very lucky having Port Fiber here because I was able to rent a wheel and the class spanned, it was over a month. It was like one Saturday, it was every Saturday for a month. So I felt like I got some good guidance and practice. It was definitely a lot easier learning the second time around and having somebody right there teaching. Um, and from there, I just practiced, kind of dove into some projects. And I think though, what was a turning corner for me and what kept me really going was then finding like the School of Sweet Georgia and their spinning classes and Jillian Moreno's book, which I have talked about a million times and like Ply Magazine and then starting to meet other spinners. I started following more spinners on Instagram, seeing what they were doing and I was just blown away by the possibilities. So it really was just this snowball effect of, it was so much fun to do. I also will say, backpedal a little bit, I loved that it took me back to what knitting was for me before it was my job. And I will say, I still love knitting the way I did before it was my job. It is my, I regularly tell my husband, like, I just love knitting. <laughs> you know, like it just, it's got my heart, but it is my job now. And so what I found with spinning was, oh, there's no pressure on this or on me. Like nobody else needs to like the yarn I'm making or it's, it, it was just, just for me. And it was so meditative and I loved that it kept my hands busy, that I wasn't picking up my phone. I wasn't getting distracted looking on Instagram or anything like that. It was just this really meditative new thing for me in my life that 
brought me a lot of joy. Uh, and from there, once I started knitting with my hand spun, I was like, oh my gosh, this is so amazing. So yeah, that was that's a little bit of my story, what kept me going. Uh, I've shared a couple times my first what I think of as my first project was my nurtured sweater. I then also pretty quickly spun, my friend Kay sent me some fiber and I spun a sweater, spun a sweater. I, well, I spun the yarn and did a sweater for my son. Um, so I, then I did that and just like kept going from there. I then started doing socks, which I have a little show and tell after this question. Um, so I would say what has kept me spinning too, because that's it, right? Like, I think we all have kind of this with our crafting sometimes. Like for me, I seem to just want to sew in the summer. I meant in the spring. I love sewing and I get obsessive over it, but just in the spring. <laughs> and then I have trouble making time for it. And with weaving, uh, for me, I haven't quite gotten into my rhythm of making it a regular practice yet, but I find that a lot of us, and I hear knitters say it all the time, where they kind of just ebbs and flows for them a little bit. And so sometimes I think we, or for me personally, it's the learning something new and trying it out that really keeps me interested and engaged and wanting to keep going. So I think that is what was so nice, especially during the pandemic, was having some of those online classes that I, I mean, I watched them like Netflix while I would spin or knit and it just really kept my enthusiasm alive for learning this new craft and getting better at it and seeing where it could take me. So um, yeah, I hope that kind of, answers that question. And I'm so excited that you're participating in the weekend or spin it to knit it. And I hope that you love your journey during the knit along, spin along, knit along. All right. So to end today, I do have a little show and tell. These are my latest pair of DRK everyday socks. I took quite a while to knit these guys up. Um, which is funny because this is one of the first times. So I do the Hello Yarn Fiber Club. And what happens with things like fiber clubs is if you've already got a spin or something going, a lot of times like that package comes in the mail, but then you don't get to it for a while. And so this is one of the few times where I was like, you know what, I am getting this on my wheel right now and I am going to spin a sock yarn and knit some more socks. So that was really fun. It was one of the first times I could just immediately get the fiber on my wheel and spin it up. So I actually have not even had a chance to wear these yet. I knit them over a couple months. Like these were just like my slow uh, carry around project. But um, this is also very much not my colors. I don't usually do kind of like jewel tones like these, but I love them and I, I love how they're just like little sister socks. You can kind of see the color pattern. <laughs> um, and it's always fun, I think, to push those color boundaries and maybe use colors that you typically wouldn't. So anyways, there is this week's show and tell. And I guess that's all I got for you. I hope that y'all have a wonderful weekend. And I hope that I get to see you back here next week. Bye.